Hello and welcome to my video. Okay, now this is a video in three parts, I guess, really. Um, the first is that I'm glazing a painting that I painted a few months ago. And um, it's quite a quick section of the video, it doesn't take long. Basically, this is uh, Japanese red. You can use any colour you like, it doesn't matter. It depends what, what uh, you want to uh, sort of make your picture lean towards. But anyway, I want mine to lean towards red, so this is Japanese red. Uh, linseed oil and um, off we go just a rough old brush you don't even need to use a brush absolutely uh, to be blunt so um, you can use anything you could just use rags or paper towel so I'm just putting it on roughly in the area that I think it would look good on the clouds and uh, which is, tends to be the underside and um, that's it really I mean, what can you say? I can sit here and say, well, I'm now waggling the brush at the top there, and I'm going to wipe it across the horizon. But you can see what I'm doing. Funny thing, teaching art, because um, it's so visual. It's obviously, it's a, it's a painting, it's something you look at. So the, the best way to learn how to do anything on a painting is to watch somebody do it. So there we are, not too much um, paint, really. I think I might stick a bit over on the uh, right hand side in a moment and, um, and then I lay into it with paper towel. All of my paintings um, are painted for glazing to be done on later. Um, a few people have said oh they look really gloomy and doomy and uh, dark. Well yeah I like dark. Um, I like mysterious and I like drama. Um, but um, they ultimately all get uh, a, a bit of glazing. You could glaze with any colour you like, really. I mean, I could have put yellow on there, or I could have used uh, a bit more blue. Just depends what you feel like, really. Um, I will be using some of the exact same red on the landscape uh, in a few moments, just to add a bit of warmth to the uh, to the green. Some people do this with um, hardly any oil added. They just sort of take the paint straight out of the tube and just put it on the on the painting and then wipe back. Well, you wipe off the bits that you want uh, there to be less colour. So that's all. It's not a mysterious thing. People think, oh, glazing. One day I'll, I'll go on a course and learn glazing. Well, there's glazing. You don't need to go on a course. The, later on in this pic, uh, painting, um, I'm going to uh, do something which I, I do quite often with paintings, and that is I start a painting and then change it uh, halfway through. I start to, I, I know usually reasonably quickly in a picture um, whether it's going the right way or whether I'm happy with it. Uh, and this is one of those cases where I think I produced a, a presentable picture, but uh, I saw that it had potential in a different direction. So anyway, put that more of that later. This is um, this is almost done here, really. Uh, you know, uh, I've explained it in several of my videos. I do the painting, let it dry. You you can only do this on a dry painting, by the way, completely dry. Do the painting, let it dry. Sit and look at it for a few months or weeks, depending on how quickly it's drying. And then just make your mind up what what sort of tone you want to add. You know, it's uh, it's one of those things where you get a bit of time to contemplate. Obviously, if I was doing this all with a little brush, you know, adding this uh, red to the clouds while I'm painting it, it would have been a little bit of a struggle. But this is this is easy. It's only I don't know, nearly four and a half minutes into the video, and it's pretty well there. A little bit of pushing along there. I mean, sometimes I might add a bit of white just to uh, enhance a few places, but I didn't bother with this one. It just didn't seem worth it. As I said, a bit on the foreground. Um, green is uh, an interesting colour. It, um, to me, not everybody, to me, it needs to have a certain amount of red in it. And, um, that's what I'm doing here. Now, I'm putting on quite a lot here, but obviously I'll be... Uh, wiping it a little bit. 
And there we are. So no need to see that. I just, I, I, I wiped off a little bit. There's the finished painting. Um, I could let that dry now and then go back to it and add another colour, maybe in the future. So the next picture. To start with in this one, I'm just using these colours here. That's uh, sap green, as usual. Uh, red ochre paints grey. Excuse my shirt, it's a painting shirt. I don't, um, I don't go for high fashion when I'm uh, painting. And this is a fast drying linseed oil. It's got a sictive in it. It's got quite a powerful sictive. Um, my paints and my oils are all made by Le Franc and Bourgeois, um, which I get from, uh, oh, it's a very cheap brush from a hardware store as usual, and uh, a plastic plate. Um, yeah, I get, I get them from a shop. Uh, in France. You can go online. It's called Cultura and uh, they have the uh, quite a good range, not a complete range, I have to say, a good range of Le Franc and Bourgeois paints. And uh, a lot of people ask me what, what paints I use, so that's it. Um, so here we go. Big blob of green, big blob of, uh, well, medium-sized blob of red ochre and a bit of Payne's grey as a garnish on the side. And this is the linseed oil. Now, this is an interesting experience. S sometimes I use linseed oil that doesn't have a sicative and it will stay runny for, I don't know, 20 hours. Depend it depends on the um, conditions. Um, and uh, to some extent, the uh, weather conditions um, and uh, you know you get a lot of flexibility with this one I found that it dried incredibly quickly because what you're going to see is first of all me doing the painting and ending up with a bit of a panoramic landscape and I posted this on uh, Facebook and on Instagram and lots of people liked it and um, I'm going to demolish it but not yet. First of all, I'll show you how I actually produce the painting. My usual technique, dark color made from sap green and red ochre, and the paint's gray. Lots of slightly random shapes just to see what comes out. Now that thing in the sky, well, that looks as though it's in the sky there. Um, it sort of is in the sky. It looks like a mountain, it's not. It's not intended to be anything at the moment. It's just tone. And I just want to see what I can get out of the tone. See if there's any uh, any hidden pictures in there. That is my horizon line. So the the tone above it is uh, is definitely sky. A few a few random shapes. Not trying to do anything. Not trying to. Not really trying to be anything. Um, I don't, uh, at this stage, I don't think to myself, uh, horizon, tree, field, whatever. I just put the shapes down to, because there is, there is something. Uh, this, I, I have this theory that as soon as you start to make marks on a board, there's, there's a picture hiding in there, and all you have to do is find it. Just got to go and look for it. While you're watching this, uh, Bit. I'll just uh, fill you in on a few things. Um, interesting thing. I, I really like YouTube. YouTube is fascinating. Um, you can learn so much on YouTube. Just just click. Just type in any, the first word of something you're interested in and uh, something will pop up. And of course it's up to you whether you decide whether it's uh, worth listening to or it's complete rubbish. But I like the variation and it's been fascinating for me to upload videos and read your comments. And I like reading comments. I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's fun. I mean, it's fascinating and fun. Um, there are obviously some comments that I just delete. You know, if, if there's a troll, if there's a troll in my area, I'll find you and you'll be gone. So don't, don't, don't waste your time. But um, I would say 99.9% percent of the comments that I get are positive and and very encouraging and let's face it we all need encouragement we don't need people going around um, you know 
uh, being unpleasant and just basically uh, trolling and bullying. It's, it's uh, what a waste of a life. I mean, you know, get a life, as they say. So, uh, yeah, but I, I really like it. I, I uh, Just a few little uh, snippets of information. This is getting... This painting is getting to the stage where it's just sort of looking like a mess. It does clear up in a minute, and I'll just let you watch while I uh, drone on. Um, it's uh, YouTube, yes. I, I haven't owned a television for, well, I suppose, about 20 years. And um, I must admit, when YouTube first came out, I think they used to call it Jelly Vision because the picture used to wobble so much and uh, it would freeze and all kind. they had all kinds of problems. But now it's pretty sleek. Um, it doesn't matter what you're interested in. You just you just type it in that search box. You'll find you'll find something that uh, is fascinating. And I I have it on uh, while I'm uh, working. I'm either playing music or listening to a documentary. And um, I didn't realise uh, until I looked at my um, history or my was somewhere in my analytics or whatever. In the I suppose in the ten. 10 years that uh, YouTube has been worth looking at. Maybe a bit longer than that. I, don't, I honestly don't know. Um, I've, wat I've watched or listened to, while I work, uh, over a quarter of a million um, uh, programmes, either music or um, documentaries. Tends to be music when I'm painting, documentaries when I'm doing my book design work. But I think it's great anyway. And uh, it's... Um, Great way to communicate with people. Great way to learn stuff. I, I think I almost, uh, well, I don't know until I cook it, but I, I think I might have learned how to make a decent onion bhaji, but we'll, we'll test that. So, um, okay, back to the painting briefly. Uh, I'm starting to sort of form a few things in the foreground. I get, I get to a point where I think, well, let's just see how it would look if I, if I put this here or put that there. And don't forget, um, this is all done up to the point where I start to work on the sky, this is basically all done with one brush, which is about two inches, uh, maybe three, no, it's about two inches wide. Um, because with a brush like that, you have um, uh, three brushes in one. You've got, you know, you've got each corner, um, you've got each side, well, four, you've got each, each side on the flat side. And in fact, the tip as well. You can do all kinds of things with that one brush. You can even do really small stuff. And uh, um, to repeat uh, my sort of theme throughout my paintings, and it, I, you know, I call it the illusion of detail. And um, because over distance uh, like this, if you look standing up on a hill, looking down across a scene, uh, you're not seeing detail, you're just seeing um, shapes that the brain will organize into details. Now, um, this is this is a, a style of painting. Let me just uh, fill you in a bit. If you've lasted this long, uh, thank you for being here. Um, this is a style of painting that basically, when I was a student, we were told to put a tone on a canvas or a board and um, work into the into the tone. Now I I never liked doing that, and um, I used to resist. I like to make the tone start to look like something. I hope that makes sense. But rather than a flat tone over the whole picture, put variations of tone. And then don't don't be too keen on painting over them and destroying them. Uh, as you wipe away bits of your tone or your shapes, look for things as you wipe. See what there is in there. So wipe carefully. Then you may come across something that... Uh, you think, oh, I wish I hadn't wiped that because it was starting to look like something. This is one of those uh, things that is, I think, important because um, as soon as you get into a painting, once you've once you've thrown on the tones on your surface, try to get try to extract what it is you're after. As soon as you start to see it, it will encourage you to try harder, and also. But, oh, wait a minute, I just I don't want to contradict myself there. Try harder, but also relax. Don't, don't suddenly go into, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into detail mode here and make this really look like a twig. It's two miles away, but my God, that's going to look like a twig. Don't, don't even go there. Don't even go there. Just, uh, 
just keep it nice and loose. This first painting, um, you, you'll see me appearing around the picture and there's a, a lot of cutting um, because I just, I don't know, I can only apologise. I just get so into my picture that I forget the camera and I just get in the way. So what I've done for this one, I've cut myself out as much as possible. So you will see jumps in the painting. It will suddenly uh, um, look slightly more advanced, but uh, I've tried to keep the transitions reasonably smooth. So the sky has started to get shapes. Here's something that I do often in skies. I have this dark side and a light side. Um, maybe it uh, echoes my character. We all have a dark side. So anyway, um, I just like, you know, I like either dark upper left or dark upper right and the opposite side light. It's quite a traditional thing that you will see in a, a lot of classical paintings. And as I was trained to paint classical, in a classical style, uh, it sort of stuck. What I'm doing here is, um, I'm not, I, I'm sort of scumbling it a little bit with the paper, um, uh, just to sort of break down a few of the brush marks. Now, and also now here I decided a bit of Payne's grey wouldn't, uh, wouldn't go amiss, so I thought I'd a little bit of dark over the, uh, over the hills there. I'm not really sure where these um, dark pictures come from. I, uh, some people, some people don't like this style of painting. Um, some people have said on YouTube, yod comment, where people have said, "Oh, that's complete rubbish. Um, what a mess," and things like that. Well, that's their opinion. Fine. Um, I, I just like drama. I have to say, though, in my life, the only place I like drama is on my paintings. Um, I will avoid drama as much as possible. <laughs> so, uh, I'm sort of, I'm coming to the point almost in this painting where I'm starting to think I wish I'd gone a different way with it. And uh, uh, I, I don't know what it is. I can't explain it. There's just a, a feeling that you get and you think, mm, well, I'll just go through the motions here and just uh, see what happens. I, I had sort of um, I'd given up trying a little bit, and I decided that probably the best thing to do would be to just get something down for the landscape uh, and then uh, show you how to develop the sky. Because in the two paintings, the sky won't change a lot. I mean, it's basically going to be the same sort of structure um, but it's, uh, you know, I'll finish it off a bit more. There'll be clouds appearing later, but um, the landscape itself, it just didn't do it for me, really. Sometimes if that happens to me in a painting, I turn the music up even louder. and uh, Sometimes that helps, sometimes it doesn't. So now I'm obviously using a much bigger brush here. Um, the reason I'm using this is to take off brush marks. And there I am trying to get rid of a bristle. Taking off brush marks and I'm using the, the flat side of the brush, hardly touching the board. And just sort of smoothing, I suppose. Okay, now here's something that disturbs some people. Okay, the sky. This is... um. This is, I suppose, what you could call a fantasy painting. Now, in real life, you can get skies this colour. I've seen them. Some people say, no, you can't have seen a green sky. Well, you know, you, you, I've seen green skies. We get green skies here, uh, usually at the end of the summer. It's uh, obviously some kind of atmospheric phenomena. Um, so I don't worry too much about leaving a bit of green in the sky.
Okay, I'll just explain why everything suddenly got lighter there. Um, I'm I'm still uh, well. I'm having trouble with my camera, but I'm I'm also researching a little bit to get uh, something better, and I will get it. So something happened there. This is probably a more accurate representation of the lighting. It was a bit dark um, earlier, but anyway, it doesn't really matter with it. I think it doesn't matter with a painting like this. It's uh, this is just structure. Uh, I don't worry at all really about colour that much. Um, I, I'm I'm definitely um, a painter that likes likes the effect of glazing. Just to go back to the beginning, it's uh, it's com it's so flexible. You don't have to um, be a highly experienced painter to get a good result quickly. So now then a bit of um, bit of white to put on with a palette knife. This again, um, I, this, I, when I teach, uh, I teach a lot. I mean, I've got, I've got, uh, I had loads of students last year. This year is almost um, as, as many as I'm going to accept, although there are some spaces left. Uh, but I've got two, um, two, two venues this year, one in June, which is fully booked. And then there's another one in August and there are spaces in that as of today there are about five or six spaces left so uh, that's that's all going very well plus you know plus the private people come here for lessons uh, not private people people who come here for private lessons or maybe they are private but um, lots of people are showing a lot of interest and uh, but what this is something I'm just going to repeat um, uh, when I'm doing the sky like this adding white uh, you can see what I'm doing. I'm I'm being very untidy about it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. This is not a sky that is uh, to painted to look like a sky that I can see. This is just a, a sky of my mind. So um, uh, yeah, just sort of just make shapes, have fun. Uh, because I'm working on a wooden panel here. Or there's a few details so that people don't uh, have to keep asking me the same thing. I'm working on 5mm plywood. Uh, it's a good quality plywood. I've sanded it and I've put on a coat of gesso and I've sanded it again, then another coat of gesso, then sanded it again and then another third coat of gesso. Um, and you need about an hour between each coat, so that's the board. Now, I can use the palette knife like that quite roughly uh, because I'm working on plywood. If I was on, if I was working on canvas, I'd be a lot more careful because uh, it's a knife and it's quite sharp, and it could go through the canvas. So that's uh, just something I feel I should mention. So I'm, I'm just getting the sort of feeling in the sky. Uh, I'm trying to get movement. Uh, oh yes, I'm a frustrated juggler. Um, I, I'm just trying to get movement, just a sort of, you know, a theme. Get a bit of. A bit of swing in the sky and um and now just smoothing it off a bit and i'll be doing i'll be adding more white um a little later that dark um shadow top left on the painting as soon as i get out of the way is um the paint's gray is a lot more blue than you're actually seeing there so um i think it may show in the final photograph that i take so uh, as I do this with the big brush, I keep wiping it as I go. I want to move paint. I don't want to lift it and put it somewhere else. So if I'm doing that there, just moving the paint, then I'll disappear in a minute, give it a wipe like so, and then go back to it. So don't forget, you don't, you don't want to move it, you want to blur it. I don't want to lift it from one spot and put it on another. And of course, for the horizon clouds, um, or the clouds that are close to the horizon, you can use the brush in a sideways manner to get streaks. And in a moment, I'll be sweeping up on the left-hand side um, to pull the light up under the shadow of the clouds, that dark area. Now I'm using the brush even lighter, as I say to people, 
Imagine brushing the wing of a butterfly really gently. Oh yeah, now, okay, back to the teaching thing. Um, teaching has been fun, absolute fun, thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, people came from everywhere, frankly. They came from everywhere, uh, all over the world, and it was great. Some really nice people. Um, if any of you are listening, by the way, any of the people that I taught, if anyone is out there listening, um, your paintings are now all dry. Um, I've been a bit bad about sending your paintings. I've had a bit of a cardboard crisis. Could I find somewhere where I could get cardboard where they didn't want to deliver it uh, with an 18 or, f no, bigger, a 40 ton truck? So they were asking me what, what bay they should, you know, I phoned up one company and uh, they said, what bay of your factory do you want the cardboard delivered? So I said, what do you mean, what bay? And they said, well, it's a, it's a, I don't know, I think, it, I'm sure they said a 40 ton truck and you'll need a forklift truck to get the, get the board off the truck. I wasn't ordering that much. But anyway, um, so I've at last found somewhere um, where I can get board that is exactly the right size. Uh, I would like to have bought it in France. Unfortunately, I had to. I had to. Well, not for, unfortunately, but it seems a bit silly to have to to be living in France and to have to board, order the board from England. So um, anyway, that'll be arriving uh, in the next week, possibly, and it means that I can pack up all the paintings quickly and get them shipped off to you. These are the paintings that are done by the students when they came here. So that's a move in the right direction. And uh, thank you for your patience for the, the people who've been waiting. This won't happen next year because I will order more board and have it ready and waiting. So um, here we are now. I put, a, I put quite a lot of red on the foreground there. I'm just sort of spreading it out. Notice how the brush marks uh, make nice lines on the fields. You, you could spend um, the next week or so painting each line, uh, if you like, or you can do it with one, one swoop with a brush. This is also one of the reasons why I like to use cheap brushes, um, because uh, you do get a, ni a nice effect, you get nice textures from, uh, from those brushes. Uh, you may notice I've got the camera um, over to my right here. That's um, something that lots of people suggested. I was worried that uh, the focal um, point would be um, would be rubbish, but it's it's okay. So. Obviously, I'm using the edge of the brush there to do the, that line of trees, and it's quite a nice little technique that because you you use the brush to make the tree trunks. Just use the edge of the brush, and uh, there they are. They just appear. Now I'm um, getting much closer now to uh, to the change of mind and the um, quite dramatic alteration to this picture. This is something that I've been wanting to... Well, it's what I tell my students. Don't get attached to your painting. When you start something like this, um, if it's just you in your studio painting away, nobody else knows what you're doing. So if you start a painting and you think, well, I just... It may be okay-ish, but I'm not completely 100% happy with it. Nobody's watching. Just destroy it and start again. Believe me, it will help your painting. Rather than make something look laboured and overworked, just, just start with a clean slate. Wipe it off. Now, earlier on in this video, I mentioned the oil that I'm using and the really rapid drying... Um, uh, sictive that is has been added i didn't add any to this this is this is called rapid drying oil now i've used it before and it's never been quite this rapid but um this is all done in one day this painting so it's only really about um three to four hours i guess uh from the time i started to the time we're at now where i start to wipe off this painting 
This is how it ended up. Not bad. I mean, it's okay. It's uh, passable. So the first thing I noticed was that the oil um, had really started to um, adhere to the surface. And when I started wiping, it was very sticky. So I had to add oil to the paper, as you can see there, and um, just start really leaning into it to, to get the uh, image off. It was a bit of a struggle, but the important thing um, to remember, as I've said before, is as you wipe off, look at what wipes off. Look at, look at how it changes the picture. Because um, sometimes it's, uh, it's interesting. You get uh, quite nice textures. Just adding a little bit more oil to my paper. The idea that I had in my mind for the uh, transformation of this picture is something that I've uh, painted similar to something I've painted before, and it's basically uh, a stream. Um, well, I suppose a stream or just a bit of flooded ground in a field. Um, a little, a little bit of information about how I go about my paintings. I've mentioned this in videos before. I don't, um, I don't take photographs and copy photographs. Um, I do take photographs that I can take home and study for close-up details of foliage, but I don't, um, I don't actually copy any pictures that I've taken. I was um, uh, lucky to be born with a slightly eidetic memory. I didn't realise this until I was. Uh, uh, probably in my 20s, that I had a good visual memory for places that I've seen. So I, I think this is somewhere that I've been. Um, it's, um, I couldn't tell you where it is. It's probably England, because most of my formative years were spent in England. And uh, it, I did spend quite a lot of time um, on Dartmoor, uh, which is in the southwest of England, for those of you who don't know. And it's quite a wild sort of place, the Dartmoor National Park. And I used to go there occasionally and just go for a walk for a day and just look at the landscape and uh, absorb it. It's very useful. Uh, it means that um, I... It's a strange thing. I, I'll, I'll explain how it works. It, I go out, I look at somewhere that I think is uh, possibly a good subject to paint, and I stand and I stare at it for literally just about three or four minutes. Once I've done that, it's uh, stuck in my visual memory uh, for good. Quite often, when I um, go to bed at night, I lie down and I, um, I have a sort of slideshow that I have to go through each night. I don't have any choice in this. I just uh, see this slideshow of things that I've seen during the day and they flash up one after the other. And it can be all kinds of things. It doesn't have to be scenery out in the landscape. It can be a, a part of my studio. It may just be um, something that I picked up looking at a painting that I'd done before, or it could even be um, an image of my work table, which is, uh, I suppose, could be loosely described as a, a, an extreme mess. Um, tubes of paint everywhere, various palettes, brushes lying around, all kinds of stuff. And I'll, I'll see all these things before I go to sleep. Um, I can turn it on usually when I'm painting, uh, just to, it's almost like projecting the image that I, I eventually want to paint onto the board in front of me. Uh, so it's, it's almost like tracing, I'm just painting over what I see on the board. It's a very strange thing, it's um, more common than you would think, a lot of people have this but they possibly don't realise it. Once you, uh, once you get practiced in this, um, you can just recall images that you've seen before. It proved very useful when I was a, a graphic designer years ago. Um, one, one particular memory that I have was uh, I was working in a studio in Brighton in England back in the uh, early 70s. 
And I remember one day my boss said to me, um, uh, I'm, I'm going home now, he said, but we need something done by tomorrow morning. Can you work overnight? And of course, I was young and keen. So I said, yeah, no problem. And he explained to me what he wanted me to draw. And it was basically a, um, a, a scene with a, a man and a woman dressed in Edwardian clothing having a picnic um, by the side of a river. And uh, in this picture, I had to sort of recall um, things like Edwardian clothing, um, what a boat would look like from a certain angle uh, in the in the water, um, and on the right there was a um, a drawing that I'd done. Um, I had to draw of a tree with a squirrel in the tree uh, eating a nut, which was slightly bigger than everything else in the picture because that that was the logo of the company that wanted to, that had commissioned this drawing. So um, this is obviously pre-internet and uh, the only reference that we had in the studio were, were a few books of people in various poses, which um, was uh, a common item in a lot of design studios. So, um, and it had to be drawn in pen and ink too. So I had to produce this by the next morning with no reference at all. And uh, I, I managed it. And uh, it was then I fully realized how useful uh, this, uh, this eidetic memory was. So um, that's, that's how I work now, really. I just sort of recall stuff. Some people have looked at my paintings and said, oh, I know where that is. And the only thing I can say is that possibly they've been where I've been. I don't know. Life is a mystery. So now I'm, um, here's a good tip or two to bring the foreground into the foreground, make it darker and add red. Red and black, I, I don't use black, but uh, the darks are considerably um, dark, uh, will always hit the retina before the lighter colours. So all these dark shapes I'm putting there in the foreground um, just naturally um, create perspective. The big brush I'm using is perfect too. Uh, you'll notice in a minute that, uh, well, I'm doing it a little bit there, but I'm sort of trembling the brush a little bit. But if you if you uh, get this technique right, um, you can produce grass and reeds extremely fast. I'd sort of um, flick the brush like that with my middle finger uh, back and forth on the surface, and uh, it produces a nice grassy uh, effect. And in a moment or two, I will be putting on some water. A lot of people ask me about water. It's um. It can be a little tricky, but um, there are ways to uh, get around it. You don't have to paint every wave uh, and every shadow in the water. What I tend to do is use a palette knife, and uh, I tend to, to paint the highlights that hit the water. Before we get to that, though, I'm just adding a bit more distance to the skyline by pushing the um, trees uh, into the white of the sky. So they mix together and they become lighter and automatically fall into the distance. Obviously, as fields um, recede from your point of uh, view, they get flatter. Uh, because if you paint them too too deep and uh, rectangular, it'll look as though you're looking at them from the air. And of course, we're not. We're looking at it from uh, a normal sort of eye level. So here we go with the water. This is um, obviously a palette knife, and I'm just using pure white uh, straight from the tube, not adding any extra oil because there's enough oil on the board to mix with the white to make it a little bit more fluid. So I wipe the um, palette knife so that the colour that I add is as uh, white and bright as possible. And I use this like ironing technique back and forth. It's very important to keep your horizontals as horizontal as possible when you paint water. The only water that goes downhill is a, is a waterfall.
Same principle here as with the fields, smaller, flatter shapes in the distance. And as I come down into the foreground, I make the marks broader and deeper. I used to avoid painting water quite a lot. I've um, there's a there's a, a, a style of painting called tonalism which I tend to lean towards, and uh, there's a sort of um, traditional composition in a lot of tonalist paintings, and that is to have sky, earth, and water. Uh, and I I've always tried to avoid it because well everyone else was doing it and I didn't want to do what everyone else does. However, on this one I'm doing this because uh, popular demand, a lot of people have asked me, how do you paint water? So hopefully this will explain it. And it's a visual explanation, of course. I'm not, uh, there's no point in me telling you uh, about exactly what's going on. You do need a, you need a knowledge of perspective, obviously, because things get bigger and broader as they come uh, into your um, plane. So uh, you just have to keep an eye on it. There is this rule that I do tend to stick to, um, although I do like to break rules, but there is a certain rule. Um, and that is that um, if it looks good, keep it. If it doesn't, or if you th even if you have the slightest feeling that it isn't right, change it. There's no point to getting depressed over it. Just push the paint till it goes exactly where you want it. When it looks good, stop. This is the, the one word when people come here to learn, they hear me say this a lot. As they're painting, I say, stop. And uh, the thing is to stop immediately. As soon as, you, as soon as you have the slightest doubt about what you're doing, stop. Eventually you'll get enough confidence to, um, to, to do that automatically. And you won't need to stop so much. On the composition of this picture, you may notice that the water um, goes off basically and ends in a point over the, to, over to the left, uh, midway up the painting. That's like to lead you over to that, uh, that area, which is about three or four inches in from the left-hand side of the painting. Then I've got a light spot uh, below the trees. If you move to the right, um, there's a light spot below that really dark clump of trees. That's to lead you up towards the sky. I like people to go in the landscape, um, follow a, a, across the painting. You don't want people to go out of the painting. You want to keep them in it as much as possible, obviously. And um, and then, so it's like a zigzag. I think they call this this composition the serpentine competition, uh, composite competition, <laughs> composition. Uh, so you're going off to the left, then across to the right, then up to the sky. It's like a, if you imagine a snake. Uh, lying across the landscape. It's all very, very subliminal. So the, the thing is not to make it too obvious. It can look, uh, if you make it too obvious, it just looks, well, silly, I think. And here I'm adding a few lights and darks over in the left there. Uh, hopefully this will become more clear in the photograph at the end of the video. You'll see the um, the photograph and it's a, a much better reproduction. In a moment I'll be using paper to add some texture to the dark area on the bottom right. You could leave it dark like that. Um, it's, it's quite mysterious I suppose but uh, a little bit of texture does help. This, um, what I'm doing here is I've got a little bit of paper and I just sort of screw it into a, a, a tight ball and then just drag it through the paint just to enhance the light over there. So back to the sky. Now, um, because the, the paint is drying really fast, uh, I was able to uh, go over the wet paint underneath with um, uh, a bit more white 
and again. On the subject of clouds, um, I repeat this often. Clouds um, are all different. There's all um, there's all different shapes. You don't have to, you know, do the hard bobbly uh, what I call cauliflower in the sky. Um, just just nice and random, and uh, trust me, it will work. In a moment, when I've put this um, extra white uh, on enough, when I when I feel I've just got the sort of shape that I want, I will go over it with the big brush again, and um, just to blur it out a bit and uh, soften it. So we're not far from the end now. Um, it's been an interesting painting for me because when I started this video I was really not thinking of changing the painting. I mean I mean, I, I, I had an inkling that I would do that quite early on but my initial thought was well let's just do a bit of glazing and then a new painting and leave it at that but I, I think it's a good thing for people who are new to this uh, to see that you can recover and completely change a painting uh, without becoming too attached. And it adds to the excitement. You never know what you're going to get. Uh, another thing uh, at the top there, uh, you'll notice that I always make the clouds uh, bleed off the top of the picture. Or if they go to the side of the painting, I bleed off the side uh, because um, clouds don't just exist in your painting. You have to imagine that you're looking through a window and the, um, the clouds, as I always say, have a life outside your painting. So a bit of blurring. I'll leave you to watch the end and just say a few things. I hope you've enjoyed the video. Um, I will eventually get a much better quality camera. Uh, I've struggled a little bit with this one. Not that that's... Um, they say, by the way, on YouTube that uh, you should never make excuses, but uh, I think it's a valid one. Yes, I did... Uh, I am having a bit of a problem with the camera. But anyway, if you have liked it, I hope you will... Uh, continue to watch my videos um, if you haven't subscribed please do and there's a little bell icon next to the uh, subscribe button if you click on that you'll be notified when i upload a video here's the final picture and um, i will see you on the next video something i should mention though before i go i have a patreon page if anyone's interested in supporting me just a little bit um, thank you very much if not don't worry I will see you on the next video. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.